Attention on deck. That's an old Navy saying. And kind of applicable to here because uh, our CEO, God, we are in his house. So on behalf of the Skyview Valley Church of Christ, we welcome If you are a visitor here, you were a visitor when you walked in. We hope you are not now. Before you get out of this building, we definitely hope you are not a visitor. And good morning, my church family. I am so grateful for my family. I'm so grateful for those that I know and love here. We are in God's house. And we live in a country that is still free. We have a lot of blessings that we can look to God and say thank you for. And before I forget, we do have in back of the seats your little cards to fill out uh, for prayer request. And with that, if you would bow with me as we approach our Father. Lord, God, our Father, we thank you that we live where we can come and worship you freely. We thank you for your mercy, your forgiveness, for we stumble often. We say things that we would like to take back, but once they're said, they're out there. So many things where we are not as we should. Forgive us, Father. Help us in receiving that forgiveness to forgive others when they trespass against us, which happens many times every day. And we've got to think, do they have something really special in their heart that they're not paying attention? There we go also so many times. We are so blessed and we pray that as we proceed throughout this service, our thoughts, words, our songs of praise unto you will be pleasing unto you, Father. We pray these things in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. Step by step. Oh God, you are my God, and I will never praise you. Oh God, you are my God, and I will never praise you. I will seek you in the morning. And I will learn to walk in your ways And step by step you'll lead me And I will follow you all of my days Oh God, you are my God And I will never praise you Oh God, you are my God and i will ever praise you i will seek you in the morning and i will learn to walk in your ways and step by step you'll lead me and i will follow you all of my days and i will follow you all of my days and I will follow you all of my days And step by step you'll lead me And I will follow you all of my days Amen. That is the goal every day. Faithful love. Beautiful song, Faithful Love.
Faithful love flowing down from the thorn-covered crown makes me whole, saves my soul, washes whiter than snow. Faithful love calms each fear, reaches down, dries each tear, holds my hand when I can stand on my own. Faithful love from above came to earth to show the Father's love, and I'll never be the same, for I've seen faithful love face to face, and Jesus is his name. Faithful love is a friend just when hope seems to win. Welcome face, sweet embrace, tender touch filled with grace. Faithful love, endless power, living flame, spirit's fire, burning bright in the night, guiding my way. Faithful love from above came to earth to show the Father's love, and I'll never be the same, for I've seen faithful love face to face, and Jesus is his name. Amen. Good morning, family. I, uh, I heard something on the radio this morning that piqued my interest. And I didn't have a notepad real close, so I wrote it down, starting to fade, because I washed my hands a little bit ago. But the, the concept of the discussion was, where do you get your worth? Are you self-defending yourself against the challenges of the world? Or are you God-defended? That was the phrase that the speaker kept coming back to. Self-defended or God-defended? So that's a great question. But if you're, if you're self-defending, you're missing out on the power of God. So, so take that a step further. Are you self-reliant or God-reliant? Well, we know what the answer should be, but how many times do we look to ourselves as the source of our answers? We're here in the giving. There, there's a point here. Give me a second. There's, we're here at the giving. And this is the point where we give back. But are we giving back what we've prepared or what God has prepared us to give back? Here's the scripture that, that goes with this. It's in 2 Corinthians 9. And it's right after that, that one that we, we use fairly regularly. Each one of us, this is 9, uh, starting in verse 7. Each one of us must give in his heart must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or, com or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Okay, I see a lot of smiling faces. Hold it. Yep, I see a lot of smiling faces now that I get my glasses on. But it goes more than that. That idea of if God enables, if God provides, the next verse, verse 8, and God is able to make all grace abound to you so that having all sufficiency in all things at all time, you may abound in every good work. So are we looking to God as the, as the answer for how much we should give? Or did we do the budget and after the car and the house and the food and the Netflix and the phone payment, we're going to give what's left? I think we need to challenge our thinking. Let's let God, if we're truly relying on God as our hope, let's truly rely on God for everything. Would you pray with me? Our Father God, we stand before you, and you see us as we are. 
you see the times when we fall short and we count on ourselves, that we look to our answers for the challenges that come to us, that we look to our strength, which is nothing compared to yours. Lord God, we ask that you would open our eyes and our hearts, that we would serve you in all things, that we would truly turn over to you those things that are yours. Lord, help us to give back in a way that reflects you as the great giver. Lord God, we thank you for your hope, for your love, and for the mercy you shower us with, even when we don't deserve it. It's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Where the gates swing outward never. Just a few more days to sorry, how on. Got too much going on here in my brain. <laughs> when the roll is called up yonder's coming up, I'll look at that. I uh, can't be thinking about that right now. <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> it's tough when you get a song stuck in your head oh boy just a few more days to be filled with praise and to tell the old old story then when twilight falls and my savior calls i shall go to him in glory I'll exchange my cross for a starry crown where the gates swing outward never. At his feet I'll lay every burden down and with Jesus reign forever. Just a few more years with the toil and tears and the journey will be ended. Then I'll be with him where the tide of time with eternity is blended. I'll exchange my cross for a starry crown where the gates swing outward never. At his feet I'll lay every burden down and with Jesus reign forever. What a joy will be when I wake to see him for whom my heart is burning. Never more to sigh, never more to die, for that day my heart is yearning. I'll exchange my cross for a starry crown where the gates swing outward never. At his feet I'll lay every burden down and with Jesus reign forever. Amen. Looking forward to that day. And I know you are too. When the roll is called up yonder. Amen. When the roll is called up yonder. When the trumpet of the Lord shall sound and time shall be no more and the morning breaks eternal bright and fair. When the saints of earth shall gather over on the other shore and the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the roll is called up yonder, 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 I'll be there. On that bright and cloud this morning, when the dead in Christ shall rise, and the glory of his resurrection share. 
When his chosen ones shall gather to their home beyond the skies, and the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the roll is called up yonder, 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 I'll be there. Let us lay before the master from the dawn till setting sun. Let us talk of all his wondrous love and care. Then when all of life is over and our work on earth is done, and the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the roll is called up yonder, 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 I'll be there. When the roll is called up yonder, 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 I'll be there. Amen. Today's scripture reading is found in Acts 6, 8 through 10. And Stephen, full of grace and power, was doing great wonders and signs among the people. Then some of those who belonged to the synagogue of the freedom, the freed men, as it was called, and of the Syrians, of those of the Alexandrians, and of those from Sicilia and Asia, rose up and disputed with Stephen. But they could not withstand the wisdom and the spirit with which he was speaking. Well, greetings, church family. It's good to see all your smiling faces this morning. And I hope your week's been a good one. Well, at least you survived it, right? And that's one less week you have to worry about. You're now officially one week closer to eternity. And here you are on the cusp of yet another opportunity to overcome the misgivings and misunderstandings and misjudgments of last week and improve your standing with God. So regardless of any blunders or failures that, you, that maybe you've done or experienced, you get to hit it again. You get another opportunity. So let today truly be the first day of the rest of your life and start out fresh and clean and serve a triumphant, victorious, risen savior now i want to say a few words about the final slide that i plan to show this morning uh you i'm sure you will recognize it i've been using this slide at the end of my sermons for a good long while now uh if at any time during the services or even during you know the sermon even now if you have a question or a comment or a concern, please feel free to text. That's right, text in church. Can you, can you, you know, some of you are thinking, oh, that's terrible. It means you're not paying attention. But I'm saying it means you are paying attention. So if you have something, concern or something, send me a text. I'm not going to answer until I'm done or after the services. Send one to the elders. But that, that just gives you an opportunity. It's fresh in your mind. Uh, Preacher said something, hey, I need to know more about that. Uh, send that question. It's that way we capture it and we're able to address it. So uh, while our worship service is in full execution mode, you can go ahead and do that. Uh, our numbers are also in the bulletin, by the way. So if you got a bulletin and, and uh, once the slide goes away, you say, oh, I didn't get that number. It's in the bulletin. Just go ahead and do that. Uh, maybe you'll feel the need to respond to the message later. But don't feel comfortable physically coming forward in front of everybody uh, once I'm finished beating everybody up. So it's not a problem at all, I'm telling you. So we don't mind if you're uncomfortable. Okay, that's okay. 
Sometimes the word of God, the will of God, our own shortcomings, sometimes that makes us feel uncomfortable. We just don't want to be the reason. We don't want us to be the reason you're uncomfortable by creating hurdles and causing undue embarrassment and so forth. So uh, talking to one of us afterwards or texting, less threatening, it's perfectly fine. I also want to point out the QR code that's on there. This is the, the same QR, QR code that's on the first page of the bulletin and on the flyers that are out on the doors. Please, if you're a visitor, scan the code. Use your fart home, smartphone, go to the web page that pops up, leave your contact information, leave a comment, leave a question, tell us about yourself, whatever it is, give us some feedback about uh, what you're experiencing. So that's available to you. Now we don't share your information. We don't share anything with anybody outside the church. Nothing that you don't want us to share. So you're not giving up information or uh, you're not gonna get spammed or anything like that or bombarded for doing it. It's just a very efficient way for us to track information, track people, provide the best services we can. We want it to be as user-friendly user as possible, as user-friendly as we are, or as we try to be. We're all on the same journey together and trying to find the best path to eternity. So come for the fellowship, stay for the eternity. Might just come up with a new tag for, for our uh, sign outside. So you know what's hard to do? Really, really hard to do. It's hard to do and say the right thing. Oh no, surely not, right? To be right and yet be misunderstood or worse, to be opposed or rejected by people who choose to disagree with you for whatever reason. You may not know their motives, but sometimes people are just so set against you that to them, nothing you do or say is right. Ever had that experience? You're just a target of opportunity. There's a Facebook meme that I posted on our group page recently uh, that helps to get at this. The problem, the problem isn't necessarily that, that you might be incorrect. That's not the problem. Or incompetent or repulsive in some way. You know, I don't know, you might be repulsive, but it wouldn't be because you're wrong, right? Or intentionally in error. The problem is sometimes the truth itself is offensive. Sometimes the facts in a, you know, the facts of about a, a certain matter, uh, they're painful to hear because they bring pressure to change something, change the way you think, change the way you feel, change your behavior, change your attitude. Maybe you have to change teams or loyalties or affiliations. Maybe your attitude needs to change. The problem with all that pressure is sometimes, maybe often, we don't want to change. The illusion of being right is sometimes so intoxicating and self-affirming that you can't bring yourself to challenge it. You just, you just know you're right. No one wants to be on the wrong side of anything. Basic human nature. So when you're plugging along, blissfully enjoying the comfort and stability, of whatever truth you may have arrived at and someone else comes along and they don't walk and talk the same way or think the same way and they have a different truth, one different than your truth, it's easy to feel uncomfortable. Nice neutral word, uncomfortable. Well, sometimes we get into that familiar paradigm where we say things like, well, we could both be wrong. But we can't both be right at the same time in the same sense. If our facts and our conclusions don't match, right? Makes sense, right? In other words, if we're in disagreement about something, it's entirely possible that we can both draw wrong conclusions and both be wrong at the same time. But if the truth can be known and one of us has actually found it, it's impossible for us both to be right at the same time if the other one of us has found a different truth. Make sense? The idea that you have your truth and I have my truth, and we can just go on our merry way, happy that we both found truth of some kind. 
is just flat wrong. It's, I just, it's just wrong. That's the opposite of truth. But we're not talking about comfort or discomfort. We're talking about the pressure you feel when confronted with what challenges your firmly convicted commitment to how you see truth. What do you do? What should you do? Well, if you discover that your happy little truth might be wrong, there's pressure to choose either to ignore it and continue on happily enjoying the truth you like or change. You should all have ex exuded a collective gasp when I spoke that ghastly offensive word, change. Well, go ahead. You have my permission to squirm. You can do that if you want to. It's okay. I'll do my best to refrain from overusing that word or change. Uh, I've already used it something like 11 times now so far. Kind of gives me a little anxiety. And I'm the one saying it. This may be the single most threatening word in a church's vocabulary. But we'll take that up in a different discussion another time. What's even worse is sometimes people choose to hang on to their truth, even with overwhelming evidence stands against it. And they seek to undermine or destroy what's really true, usually by attacking those who align themselves with what's really true. Phrases like live and let live, agree to disagree, never even crosses their minds. I want to take just a moment to address a little boo-boo I made last Sunday. <laughs> you may have noticed it. I mislabeled some slides. Yeah, I admit it. You know, uh, It's hard to ex accept, but I am human. So I mislabeled some slides. Several referenced Luke. You know, that is the Gospel of Luke. But the passages were from Acts. Uh, I think most of you caught that and made some adjustments, and you, you realize what I was doing. Well, in my defense, I was actually only half wrong. Because Luke did write them, right? He's the author of both the gospel and the book of Acts. So it's just that the passages that I cited weren't actually in the gospel. They're in Acts where we are. So half right isn't all wrong. Though half wrong isn't all right. Or something like that. Well, let's see what's going on in our passage. Here we, here we are. We're right on the heels of the apostles' second major encounter with the religious leaders of Jerusalem. That was what we talked about last week. Round two, it upped the stakes a little bit. They were treated much more severely second time around than they were the first time they got in trouble. Luke lets us know that the previously annoyed leaders are now enraged because these Jesus followers are boldly proclaiming the risen Lord Jesus. The apostles go on their way rejoicing that they had been found worthy to suffer dishonor for the name of Jesus. I find this to be astonishing. And we talked about that. What's more, they get even more bold and enthusiastically engage in the same exact same behavior that got them into trouble to begin with. Luke tells us, and every day in the temple and from house to house, they did not cease teaching and preaching that the Christ is Jesus. Well, now Luke tells us the, day, the days begin to pass. We don't know how many, but Luke says the number of disciples is growing. After dealing with some external threats, they're back to an internal issue, but something different from the internal issue that they dealt with with Ananias and Sapphira. This is a little different. So the Hellenists rise up. Remember that word last week, rise up? Remember that? They rise up against the Hebrews. So this is not a Jew-Gentile conflict. The Hellenists are ethnic Jews, but they come from other regions in the Roman Empire. They speak Greek as a first language, maybe their only language. The Hebrews are also ethnic Jews, probably from Jerusalem. They speak Hebrew or Aramaic as a first language, and they probably speak Greek too. But they're separate by their language that way. The issue is a fellowship issue. 
The widows mentioned in verse one appear to be the most needy and vulnerable subset of the larger group, the larger fellowship. Luke has already established that they're all one heart and soul and that no one with a need went without. So failure at this level of oneness would undermine the claim of fellowship. If they're going to be consistent in their selflessness and generosity, they cannot afford to neglect the most basic aspect of that fellowship, the basic needs of the most needy who had the fewest resources and the fewest prospects. The issue isn't you have one group or click, we sometimes say, against another click. Sometimes we recoil at the idea of a clickish church, don't we? Well, don't we hate that? That's a terrible criticism of the church is a clickish church. We don't like clicks. Well, I've always said it's unavoidable. It's impossible to have a group of people and not have clicks. Two people together is a relationship. Three people together is politics. Four or more people together means clicks. You're going to have it. There's no way out of it. The only problem with clicks is when you're not in one. You're being excluded or you're not in the one you wish you were in and you're struggling to get in and can't find a way. That's the only problem with clicks. Now, the issue here uh, is a matter of exclusion. Neglect. Brings up a question. What is the intrinsic value of a human being without any other qualification? Any human being, every human being. Do we honor only those who are producers and look the other way when the consumers come along? Mahatma Gandhi said that the true measure of any society can be found in how it treats its most vulnerable members. I have to say it's hard to disagree with that. Very hard. What kind of people will God's people be? Well, over the centuries, official Israel had devolved into an exclusively exclusive society. They looked down their noses on the nations, on everybody. Will, will restored Israel, will they repeat the same sin as official Israel? Well, the answer, of course, is no. They're not. The apostles see that a choice has to be made between ministry to the word and prayer versus ministry to the widows. And this, this is not a prioritizing which one's most important. Nothing, nothing at all. It doesn't mean the widows weren't important. Very important. This is an important issue. The passage doesn't say that they're uh, devoting to preaching the word. It doesn't use that word. It literally says we should not leave behind, that is, not neglect, or choose the word, or choose between the word and waiting tables. The word of God. We can't wait on tables and preach at the same time. So he's saying, well, we can do one or the other, but we just can't do both. This, of course, includes preaching and teaching and discussing and debating and studying and all that stuff, whatever it means to be uh, devoted to the word, right? They know this dilemma is unacceptable. Cannot be tolerated. No one should be neglected for any reason. And certainly not the ministry of the word and ministry of prayer. It's interesting how it divides that. So chapter 6, verses 1 through 6, demonstrates the inevitability of conflict. Have you ever seen conflict in the church? Has that ever happened? It will occur in the life of the church. The question is how to resolve it. Well, the apostles effectively resolve this particular conflict by acknowledging and, I mean, we can get, get some pretty good principles out of this, right? They acknowledge and accurately assess the problem. They prioritize the ministry of the word and prayer over any other concern. They established effective criteria, right? They appointed seven men full of the spirit and of wisdom. 
They allocated adequate resources, right? That these people to come and take care of them. And they implemented their plan. Well, we could take that to any organization and use it, couldn't we? Well, the result was, and what they said pleased the whole gathering. The apostles clearly distinguished between their ministry and the daily routine ministry of the church. This passage is frequently cited as an example of the activities of the office of deacons. That is, these men are seen as the first deacons. Could be. Well, this understanding hinges in part on the distinction between roles. The apostles are supposed to focus on the spiritual. Well, the deacons are to focus on the physical with some overlap in between the roles. Well, there's also the use of the word, you know, we get the word deacon from it. Well, this word means ministry or uh, dis let's just say distribution is a good type of there. It comes from the same word that means deacon or servant or minister. Uh, just someone who serves. It also describes someone holding the formal office of deacon. You know, Paul outlines this in 1 Timothy. However, the word for deacon doesn't occur in this passage at all. But it's derivative, you know, which means service, distribution, ministry. That's the only word that shows up. Also, the seven were chosen to perform ministry. It's not likely they were being appointed to an official office. They were selected to engage a specific issue at a particular time because they are the seven men who best met the criteria of being full of the spirit and wisdom. The apostles didn't appoint them, but they asked the community to select them. The full criteria, uh, it's not articulated here, only the primary requirements, which is Luke's way of introducing. So the way it's worded is designed to introduce somebody in particular, somebody who will serve a very short, but highly significant role. Stephen is mentioned first. And only Stephen is highlighted as being full of faith and the Holy Spirit. Not that the others weren't fully qualified, but it highlights this one man. Luke's agenda here is to use this minor hiccup in the life of the church to introduce Stephen and has next to nothing to say about the formal office of deacon. What unfolds is Stephen functioning as an apostle, he's not one of the 12 apostles, but the things we find him doing are things that the apostles do. He's full of grace and power. He was doing great wonders and signs among the peoples. Up till now, only the apostles are said to be doing these things. And further, Stephen is apparently engaged in preaching and dialogue even debate with those in opposition to his message. That is, they are disputing with him. Now, two things are happening all at one time in verse 7. The word of God is increasing, and the fellowship is multiplying. Not, you know, they weren't working with math problems. They were growing exponentially. Even priests are coming to Jesus. The second thing that's happening in this passage is opposition is growing. Not everyone is pleased about conflict resolution as the fellowship of the believers are. We could say with confidence at this point that dissatisfaction and opposition is also growing exponentially. In fact, things are about to come to a head. Relations between restored Israel and official Israel have reached critical mass with its arguments between Stephen and those from the synagogue of the freedmen. It's a breaking point. And it's about to rupture in a very dramatic way. Stephen hits a wall. No, well, kind of. He runs afoul of the synagogue of the freedmen. The Syrian, the Cyrenians, the Alexandrians, and those from Cilicia and Asia like the high priest in chapter 5, they rose up and began to dispute with Stephen. 
Apparently, he's not only performing signs and wonders, but as we already pointed out, he's also teaching and preaching. Previously, it was the apostles who met it, who met opposition. Now it's a non-apostle, maybe a deacon, who's meeting with the same opposition. Scholars are all over the map about who these freedmen are. Some say they're descended from the Jews who had been captured and taken to Rome by the general Pompey. Probably within the, the previous five decades during, the, during that time. Well, and then later released. Pompey had written that uh, the Jews had adhered so strictly to their religious and national customs, they were worthless as slaves. Others say they were form, former slaves. They weren't prisoners, they were just enslaved people, and they'd been set free. Some say that that list in chapter or verse 9, uh, that separates the different groups, while others say, well, no, they're all same group. These are just the regions that these freedmen came from. So it's just kind of confusing. But they're not friendly toward the church. They're not accepting of what Stephen's saying. So Stephen, it says, is so full with wisdom and the Holy Spirit that those people, those in opposition, cannot withstand his arguments. They are completely outclassed, ineffective. Their opposition is so inept that they resort to the same techniques, tactics, and procedures that the leaders of Israel have used with great effect on several occasions. They instigate false witnesses. It seems that whenever those in charge of maintaining official Israel, whenever they feel threatened by truth, they have no issue whatsoever violating the ninth commandment. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor, which is another way of saying, you shall not lie. But it's more than simply perpetuating an untruth. They are lying in a way that directly negatively impacts Stephen. The charge is that Stephen was accused of advocating the one thing that poses the greatest threat to the church today, change. It wasn't enough that he's accused of blasphemy you know, against Moses and the law. He's accused of actively campaigning for change. That had to have been the last straw, the final nail in the coffin, the coup de grace, so to speak. That's what sealed his fate. There was only one final formality left. What does Stephen have to say in his own defense? But well, we're going to find that out next time in part two. It's always struck me as curious, if not outright odd, that in spite of miraculous signs and wonders and healings that had been taking place everywhere, in spite of indisputable preaching and irrefutable proofs from Scripture, this new way that has been born is being met with increasing rejection and opposition from the very people of God. It's the church living out the experience of Jesus himself. God himself became flesh and dwelt among us and performed miracles, forgave sins, called his people to himself only to be opposed and rejected. They're still rejected. In fact, animosity is growing. Here before them is a man whose very appearance it says, is like an angel. Yet they are on the verge of killing him based on false charges. Does that sound familiar? He's been accused of bearing false witness. The only testimony offered against him as evidence is false testimony. Yet he silently, confidently sits with the face of an angel. If you wanted a concrete example of what proclaiming the word of God with boldness looks like, well, it looks like the apostles, but it looks like Stephen. No aggression, no angry preaching, nothing but the spirit of God in a man of God proclaiming the word of God. 
as we'll see next time, he's not belligerent, antagonistic. He's not a fire and brimstone finger in your face, pounding his fist on the pulpit, you know, provocateur, right? He's not that. A man, a simple man, a mere man, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, with the face of an angel. That man is boldly speaking the truth that they need to hear. The words that should convict them, like Peter's words on the day of Pentecost. Instead, his irrefutable words further antagonize and aggravate those who are truly guilty. Have you ever experienced something like that? Chances are some of us or maybe many of us have. My gut tells me most of us will at some point. I know I've been in the hot seat on more than one occasion myself. In the course of faithfully and boldly executing our mission on this earth, the chances are more than excellent that someone's going to come along, they're going to be offended, misunderstand you, mischaracterize you, outright lie about you, put words in your mouth. It won't matter if you're right or wrong. It's just going to happen. So this is uncomfortable stuff. Someone or someone's is going to spin your words, assign motives you don't have, stir up support against you, use the law against you. I'm talking about other Christians. I don't have a crystal ball or inside information. I've got some experience. I have two eyes, two ears, a mostly functional brain, an aptitude for observation. But chapter six isn't about conflict resolution or resolution techniques or how to survive being treated unfairly. That's too shallow. If that's what this is, then verses one through six don't make any sense at all alongside verse seven. And they certainly don't make sense with verses eight to 15. It all goes together. They just, if that were the case, they would come across as disconnected stories and certain facts just strung together to fill up space on this page. The big picture is the amazing mission of God, masterfully and awesomely being carried out by the Holy Spirit through the church, the fellowship of restored Israel. The preaching and teaching and healing by the apostles is extended to other members of the fellowship, to Stephen, and by extension to us. The outcome is fantastic. They are literally growing in leaps and bounds. But the flip side is not everyone thinks this is a good thing. They reveal their hands somewhat when they accuse Stephen of advocating change. Change has come. It's here. It's all about change. It's all about turning from the familiar, our comfort zones, our sinfulness, our selfishness, and turning to Jesus. That is a definition of change. It's about self-denial and picking up our crosses and following Jesus. What does that look like? It looks like Peter and John in jail. It looks like the apostles being beaten and threatened. And now it looks like a man with the face of an angel being falsely accused. And as we will see next time, ultimately executed for it. Luke wants, he, he wants us to know that this is not a problem that affects only the leadership. It affects men like Stephen. It affects followers like you and me. The measure of doing the right thing isn't always blue skies and rainbows and sunbeams from heaven. It's just as likely to be opposition and rejection. It has a cost, a price to pay. This tension is not always temporary, and it often escalates. And yet... God is in it. The Holy Spirit is in it. 
The Holy Spirit is in us and among us. God is going to use this terrible, horrible, no good day and take the church to a whole other level that they could barely have imagined before. What should our ministry look like? Our ministry of prayer. We're hitting the ministry of the word as hard as we can. Now, I'm doing the best I can to be as faithful as I can with it. And I urge you, stay with me in this Acts challenge. Remember, I'm challenging you. Read this whole book. Just read it straight through without the verse markings and all that stuff. And share it. It will pay off. That is a ministry. Just reading the word. Can we afford to allow our ministry of prayer to be limited to blessing a meal? The four or five prayers that we, you know, we knock out together here this morning? Or the 30 to 45 minutes we engage in five o'clock on Sundays? We keep bringing that up, don't we, for some reason? I'm telling you, we're missing something. The Holy Spirit actually wants us to pray. Really pray. I'm thinking about this wonderful commitment. And thank you, Carla. Thank you. That so many of us have made now to pray for Haley over the next couple of days. That is a ministry of prayer. God will bless those prayers. If we will truly engage in a ministry of the word and prayer, there is no limit to what God can do through us. None. Above all, we need to be praying that God will fill us with the Holy Spirit and with wisdom. So that when opposition mounts, and it will, we will meet it. Not with lawsuits or by pushing back or arguing, but with faces like angels. To boldly speak what is right without any regard at all for the personal cost to us. We stand together when we stand with God. Let today truly be the first day of the rest of our lives so that we start out fresh today and from, from now on, clean and fresh, serving a triumphant, victorious, risen Savior. Will you please pray, pray with me at this time? Holy Spirit, fill our fellowship with your presence and use us to boldly proclaim Jesus to a lost world around us. Fill us with your wisdom. Help us to put one another ahead of ourselves. Help us to be the church Jesus died for. And let us give ourselves as he gave himself so that the world may know him and you, the Father and the Son, are glorified. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. If you feel the need to respond, please do so while we stand and while we sing. Whispering Hope. Soft as the voice of an angel, breathing a lesson unheard. Hope with a gentle persuasion, whispers a comforting word. Wait till the darkness is over. Wait till life's tempest is done. Hope for the sunshine tomorrow after the shower is gone. Whispering hope, oh how well. Come the 
thy voice, making my heart in its sorrow rejoice. If in the dusk of the twilight dim me the region afar, Will not the deepening darkness Lit in the glimmering star Then when the night is upon us Why should the heart sink away When the dark midnight is over Watch for the breaking of day, whispering hope. Oh, how welcome thy voice, making my heart in its sorrow rejoice. Hope as an anchor so steadfast rends a dark veil for the soul whither the master has entered robbing the cave of the goal come no then come glad fruition Come to my sad, weary heart. Come, O oh, thou blessed hope of glory. Never, O oh, never depart. Whispering hope, O oh, how welcome thy voice. Making my heart in its sorrow rejoice. Amen. Song before we take the Lord's Supper, Thomas' song. Jesus, you were all to me. Why did you die on Calvary? O Lamb of God, I fail to see how this could be part of the plan. They say that you're alive again, but I saw death and every sin. Reach out to claim the darkest wind. How could this be part of the plan? If I could only hold your hand and touch the scars where nails are driven, I would need to feel your side where holy flesh my spear was riven, then I'd believe, only then I'd believe. Your cruel death was part of a heavenly plan. Holy presence, holy face, a vision filling time and space, your nearness makes my spirit race. Could this be part of the plan? I see the wounds that cause a cry from heaven, ocean, earth, and sky. When people watched the Savior die, could this be part of the plan? Reaching out to hold your hand and touch the scars where nails are driven. Coming near, I feel your side where holy flesh 
my spirit was riven, now I believe, Jesus, now I believe, your cruel death was part of a heavenly plan. I proudly say with blaze and cry, you are my Lord and my God. Amen. Please be seated. In Luke chapter 22, as Jesus was initiating the memorial meal that we now partake of, he said, do this in remembrance of me. Do this in my memory. Do this as a memorial to me. And I was trying to think of how we memorialize men. And uh, many times we build a statue or a library or name a building after them. We usually have a tomb, their name on it, maybe a famous saying that they wrote. Jesus uh, didn't want that. As we gather around this uh, table, we're not memorializing a dead man. We're memorialize, memorializing someone who is alive. We're looking back as the disciples look back at that time. It's, but he said these words, and they probably were thinking of how they'd met Jesus. They probably thought of how they'd seen the miracles, how they'd heard his teachings, and how they were pricked in their hearts. We could too, I think we should be thinking about this time, how we remember first coming in contact with Jesus, how he's touched our hearts. We could look back to that. Um, but as we partake of this bread, I think uh, we need to remember that his body is now the church, that his, he gave his life for his body, for, his, for the church. And as we partake of this bread, remember that as we look back, we can also remember him in that way and remember that he is alive today in his church let's give thanks as we partake the bread dear father as we take this bread and remember your son on the cross as we look back to that moment of pain help us to remember that it was also part of your plan that it's a time of joy too, that as he died, he took away our sins. Our sinful bodies now are dead. We could be alive, Father, to you. Help us as we take this bread to remember that we are part of your body and that we serve you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
the same way we also partake of the cup. We think of the life that's in the blood. We think of the promise that life gives us. The fact that through Jesus, we have life. We have the hope of life. As we partake of this cup, as we look back to Jesus, may we also look forward to where we have it again, and the promise to be with him. We thank you, Father, for your death, on the, for your death of your son on the cross. We thank you that we have indeed a hope of a future with you. But Father, we could always look forward to what you have promised, that you will never forsake us, that the troubles of this earth will be short. We thank you that through his blood, we have been saved. In Jesus' name we pray. Our God, he is alive. So we're going to sing verse one and verse two, and then we'll do the chorus. And then subsequently, verse three and four in chorus. Our God, he is alive. <clears throat> mm -hmm. There is beyond the azure blue, a God concealed from human sight. He tinted skies with heavenly hue and framed the worlds with his great might. There was a long, long time ago a God whose voice a prophet heard. He is a God that we should know, who speaks from his inspired word. There is a God, he is alive, in him we live and we survive. From dust our God created man. He is our God, the great I am. Secure is life a mortal mind. God holds a germ within his hand. Though men may search, they cannot find. For God alone does understand. Our God, who sun upon a tree, a life was willing there to give, that he from sin might set man free, and evermore with him could live. There is a God, he is alive, in him we live, and we survive. 
from dust our God. Created man, he is our God, the great I am. There is a God, he is alive, in him we live and we survive. From dust our God created man, he is our God, the great I am. Amen. So family, think about that message today. Are we going to deal with change? Are we going to be change? Are we going to change maybe to be more effective to serve our Lord this week? Just think about that. Those are great, uh, great challenges, and we need to be challenged. When, uh, when we talk about the ministry of prayer, there's, we're, we'll go through the prayer requests here in a bit. Uh, the elders and, and Ken are going to meet tomorrow night, 6 o'clock here at the building. If there's something that you need prayer for, if there's a challenge that you're facing, if there's something you want to talk through, we're here. Come talk to us. Um, we're even so technologically advanced, we could do a Zoom call if you're not able to get here. Uh, I know with, uh, with uh, getting darker earlier in the evenings, maybe that's not the best for everybody. Let's, let's find a way to encourage each other. Um, lots going on that we need to be praying about. There's uh, an answer to prayer sitting right here in the front row. Teddy's back. We're so thankful that you're feeling better. No, it's still a road to recovery, but so glad your road swerved in here this morning. So thank you. Uh, thank you for being here. Let's also be praying for Dean. Bless you. There's another opportunity for blessing twice. Uh, let's be praying for Dean. Dean is uh, recovering from a second surgery. He must have got like a sale on surgeries. He had two within a week. So let's, let's be lifting him up. Uh, Jody's not here this morning. Let's, let's be praying for her so she can get feeling better. And then um, next week is apple cider press. So we need to be praying for our young people and our adults who are going to that, that there will be a good time, but also safe travels. And you know, while I was, while I was making the notes for what, um, what's on the prayer list today, I found the prayer list from last week. Just because we pray for it once doesn't mean it goes away, family. We need to be continually lifting up. We need to continue to pray for uh, Jim and Glenda's granddaughter, Haley, and her family. We need to keep praying for um, Aaron, Ray's friend, who's dealing with breast cancer. We need to keep lifting up uh, Evelyn, who's down at, um, in Oregon doing that gap year, the Project Antioch study. We need to continue praying for the Flannerys with COVID. Just because we don't put them on the list each week doesn't mean they still don't need our prayer. Let's, let's be tracking together with the prayer list that's in the bulletin. Let's be praying together. We're going to meet tonight at 5 online. You don't even have to get out of your bunny slippers. Join us. We'd love to have even more people praying together uh, as, we, as we join together in a family. We're going to close again in prayer. I, I, I am so appreciative of the time that we can come together in prayer. We'll have a time for fellowship. We'll have a time to talk about all the things that are important or, or even not important as we build those relationships stronger. But family, let's be praying together and let's be in each other's lives. So would you, would you pray with me as we get ready to close? Father God, we are so thankful that we can come before you. We're thankful that you lead the way, that you show us through your love and your example, the word that you've left, us, the spirit that you give us. Lord, help us to be bold in your name, that we would not be timid about studying your word, that we'd be brave and strong in sharing your love. Lord God, help us to be your feet and your hands and your light here in this world. 
Lord, we know you give us opportunities. Forgive us when we miss them, when we're focused on ourselves. Lord, help us to serve you by serving others. Lord, be with these that we've mentioned in prayer. Lord, that we, we ask that you would work uh, your healing, that, we, that you would bring your wisdom, that you would show us your power. Lord, we don't always understand the answers. We don't always understand the big picture. But Father, help us to always put our faith in you. We thank you and we praise your name, Lord God. It's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Okay, if you'll repeat after me, we'll do our congregational scripture. New month, new verse. Philippians 1, verses 21 and 22. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I am to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Amen. All right, family, like I said, we'll be back online at five tonight. We'll hopefully see you there. Let's use the time to fellowship.